good evening and welcome into Unfiltered on YouTube TV. I'm David Kaplan, White Sox and Blue Jays getting ready on NBC Sports Chicago. We'll be back in the studio on TV tomorrow. Looking forward uh, to being back in there. Let's get to our top stories brought to you by our great partners at Four Seasons Heating, Air Conditioning, Plumbing, and Electric. Luis Robert is returning to the lineup tonight. They get a sorely needed bat back. He has missed six games as he dealt with a positive COVID test and feeling some after effects, but he says he is ready to go tonight. On the north side of the city, a flurry of roster moves. Drew Smiley is going on the 15-day I, 15 day IL with an oblique strain. Jason Hayward, Michael Rucker have been activated and Nelson Velasquez, who was up for a couple days, is being sent back down to AAA Iowa. And NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell has been asked to testify before Congress. It's part of the federal investigation into the Washington Commander's hostile work environment. Commander's owner Daniel Snyder will also be questioned by the House Oversight Committee. You mean nothing but amazing. Uh, since you had a call up and uh, you got really comfortable. Uh, he's being himself. That, that's a huge. That's huge for us as as a, as a young player. Uh, he's not afraid of uh, failing, and he's very good at the plate. Um, but in, behind him, have to be ready because uh, once I get the on deck circle, he was, he's already swinging. That means a lot <laughs> to me. I know the energy he brings. I know like the fun that he has when he plays this game. The excitement he has, and uh, it's infectious. It's contagious. Um, I know I feed off it uh, just because he's so positive and um, just fun to be around. With the injury situation, you know, a guy like And that leads us to our Cubs insider, our guy at Wrigley Field. He's Gordon Wittenmeyer, by far the best-dressed guy in that press box. Gordon, we've got a guy in Chris Morrell, and that's what he's asking to be called. He said, please, Chris, not Christopher, who is That's what I asked him. He is infectious. This guy is high-fiving relievers as they come from the bullpen. This is a guy that's trying to fist bump the umpire last night. I love watching this kid play, and I'll bet that his teammates love having him around. What is your take on the start to his career? Dude, you couldn't have, you couldn't have scripted it better. I mean, take a look at that triple last night. Not only does he slide kind of like Javi Baez, slides past the bay, grabs it, pops up. Then there's a mound visit, not a pitching change, a mound visit. Cubs still trail by one. Nobody out, he's on third. He takes the opportunity of this mound visit to go high five all his buds on the rail at the dugout and then go back to third and then score on the next hit. Uh, the guy's just, there, there's very few people. He has an if factor, right? I mean, beyond everything else, he's got talent. I mean, he's got elite defensive talent. He's got power. We saw it in his first big league at bat when he hit that home run. And since then, and this is the most impressive thing, he's patient at the plate for a young kid to show that kind of power out of the chute and then to be patient enough that he has legitimately earned a place day after day in that leadoff spot is really impressive. But the energy, the it factor with this guy is what makes him unique and sets him apart. And, and we can only hope as the people – who, who are around him, get to work with him, cover him, and certainly the fans, uh, that this guy has gets a chance to stick. Gordon, the other thing I found interesting is he's in the on-deck circle, pitchers warming up to start the inning, and he looks, he goes, hey, Mr. Ricketts, how you doing? And he shook his hand. I thought that was simply just a guy, and he said to someone who I was talking to, he said, you believe I get paid to play Major League Baseball? This is awesome. Yeah, this yeah. dude is the kind of guy that you want in your room and to be one of the front-facing guys. You know, Wilson Contreras has said this a couple of times when describing him. He's not afraid of anything. He's fearless. And having covered this game for a long time, the greats all have that, right? On the field, for sure. We saw Look, we saw that around here when they won a championship. How many of those guys – were fearless when they went out there, whether it was John Lester or Javi Baez or Anthony Rizzo, when they took the field. This guy's fearless in the sense, in addition to that, of just not afraid to be himself, not afraid to show who he is, just be who he is. That is such a, uh, 
And it's such a hard thing to do at this level on this stage for a player with no experience, a player that young. And it is, I mean, you very rarely see it. And uh, so, so to see this in him now really, it really should give you a lot of optimism about whatever his ceiling is, this kid's got a chance to reach it. All right, let's talk about the roster moves today. Jason Hayward back. Nelson Velasquez, he has options, goes back down. How long do you think Hayward is here? If you were a betting man, I know we talked about this on our podcast, do you believe Jason Hayward is on the Chicago Cubs September 10th? Look, man, I think you got half your answer to that today when he was activated, basically when he's ready, right? He was on that COVID-related IL, and he was cleared over the weekend, I think on Saturday. So, I mean, this was several days, a lot more than David Robertson or Marcus Stroman when they got cleared. In Robertson's case, he was cleared, and that day joined the team. And Stroman, I think it was a one-day leg. Here, it's several days. But they, they could have warehoused him there a little bit longer. They could have made the other moves today and not made that one if this were something that they were considering. So, look, he's get, it's getting to that point. They've got a 40-man roster crunch like this franchise. Has, in 15 years of covering this team, I've never seen the 40-man crunch in season this tight. A bunch of guys on the 60-day IL in order to free up space, and you've got um, – You've got guys that aren't even on the big league club, IL or otherwise, who are going to have to be protected from the Rule 5 at the end of the year. So they've got some very big questions. And he's right in the middle of it. I mean, look, he's got a year left on the deal. He's got about 40 uh, – at the trade deadline, he might have like $41 million left on his deal, year plus. Yeah, actually, I think, he, I think it might be about 42 now going forward. So it's a call they're going to have to make. They don't want to. They want to recoup some of that money, whether it's a multiplayer package and a trade. To answer your question, we get to September 10th. The rosters don't expand like they used to, to the full 40. They expand by a couple guys. So it might not be quite the crunch then. But if he's still on the roster then, all bets are off when they get into the offseason and they start having to protect other guys and put them on the 40 man, whether that's a release, you know, a BFA or a, a trade of some kind. Let me ask you a question. Armed with the knowledge they have today, do the Cubs re- do the Cubs sign Jason Hayward if they could go back to the day they that, signed that, I mean, that's not a fair question because is everybody else who had $200 million on the table armed with the same knowledge? I mean, is it does his market change? I mean, if you're just saying that the same player at the same price and, and, they, and they know what's going to happen, do they sign him? If you're saying that, I, I think it's I think it's a bogus question. Why? But if because it's a it's a hypothetical that that it just it's it's not a fair you can't answer it, right? I mean, obviously you wouldn't obviously it's a bad business decision. Obviously. Right. But you won but, the World Series and many have said, including Anthony right. Rizzo, without that dude in that locker room that night, we don't win. And, and that's what I was gonna say, but not only that. The guy on the field w- was of a unique need to the Cubs then. The mm-hmm. other teams, you know, the Cardinals had money on the table. The Nationals had – both those teams had 10 years, $200 million on the table. And I think there was one other one that had the same. The same. Cubs got him for 8 184 The Cubs needed him more than anybody else. They were ready to win. They were poised everywhere else, but their outfield was a sieve. They needed a guy that could hold down at a gold glove level an important position like that, which he did. He also provided a clubhouse presence. He also, at the time, gave you a competitive at bat, more so than he does now. So what he brought was what they were missing. So what, what what's that championship worth? Because do they get it without him? Maybe. Maybe. But you just said players in that clubhouse say no. And I think that so many things had to go right along the way. That, that comeback in San Francisco, maybe they lose to Cueto the next night if they don't win that game. They fall down three games to one to Cleveland in that series. So they shut out back-to-back games against the Dodgers. Little things, sometimes intangible, made a difference all the way through that postseason. Do the, I don't know if they win it without him. 
All I know is that Anthony Rizzo looked me dead in the eye, and I we were having a discussion about Jason Hayward. He said, listen to me clearly. This is exactly what he said. If that dude doesn't call that meeting and speak to us the way he did with guys sobbing in that room, we do not win game seven. Well, let's be clear. It was a Roldis Chapman sobbing in that room. Yeah, and no what, and, and And what he brought to the table was, People may not remember this. Hayward was standing on third base with one out and Javi Baez at the plate in a tie game, right? Tie game in the ninth. Three, two and count. Javi, they called for him to bunt. Right. And struck out trying to bunt. Inning went away. Hayward was furious at that call. Furious. He gets in there and he says, we're winning this damn thing for us. The guys in this room, F everybody outside that room. This is for us. And we're going to do it no matter what anybody else does, and no matter what other decisions are made. We're going to win this damn thing now. And so I do think Rizzo's got a point. No question about it. I've had other guys who were in that room tell me, your boy's right, 100%. Uh, let's also talk about this game tonight. Kyle Hendricks does not look healthy to me. He just doesn't look right. I'm not saying he has an injury. What I'm saying to you is he just, there's something off. Do you feel the same way? Well, the good news for him tonight is he's facing George Costanza. I don't know if you see the crawl yeah. there. Yeah, I yeah. did. <laughs> uh, but I don't know if he is or not. I I'm, I'm very reluctant to go there. He says he's not. Rossi points even today to some mechanical issues. And and uh, Hendricks has said there's mechanical issues in play, too. And he goes through this. He goes through mechanical issues and he gets right. He's had two really good starts this year. He's had a handful of not-so-great starts. I don't know. I, you know, I'll say this, Cap. Everybody's got a shelf life in this game. I'm not saying he's there but he's, he's not a guy that came into this game with a huge power repertoire and a lot of margin to work with. He does it on location. He does it with change in speeds. He does it with guile and a game plan. And so I don't know. I, I mean, I have faith in him just because I think he knows how to pitch like few other guys in the league do. Uh, but to answer your original question, I don't think he's hurt. Yeah, I Maybe it's not hurt. Maybe he just he just doesn't look right to me. And I remember a couple years Please. ago, I was talking to uh, somebody who was very close to Kyle, a former pitching coach of his, in Chris Basio. And Chris called me. We were just catching up. And he said, I'm telling you, Hendricks is off by this much. He said his back leg's got to be a certain height. And I wrote an article about it. If you remember, and Kyle Hendricks actually made that adjustment based on what someone said, and he went on a run. So maybe you are correct that it's a mechanical adjustment and nothing else. So now we're going back to like what you Darvish said, the cat man is right. It is wasn't me. It was Chris Basio who was right. It wasn't no, me. I'm, th I'm talking about the, the time you gave you Darvish advice. Exactly. Throw the fastball more. And then he did. He said I was right. <laughs> the, the, uh, the Kaplan, the, oh, he said the Kaplan is right. Right, you <laughs> called me from New York and went, "You're not going to believe this." Uh, I think I had some more choice words than that too. Yeah, you're not going to effing believe this. Uh, last thing, Tommy Pham slaps Jock Peterson <laughs> over a fantasy football league. He was mad about Mike Trout being the commissioner, and he let uh, a roster move happen. Tommy Pham got a three-game suspension. What do you think of this whole nonsense? Because being around teams as long as I have and as long as you have, fantasy football and golf pools and NCAA brackets at the at the spring trade, they that's a regular thing around there. Yeah, this is stupid. I mean, this is ridiculous. It's stupid on so many levels. Pham holds a grudge for that long. There was a group chat there. He accused Peterson of cheating. He says he's messing with my money. <laughs> and apparently, Peterson, I don't know if 
people watching this, go back and, and Google this and check out Peterson's interaction with the Giants media a couple of days ago when he showed the text thread and he showed the gif that he that he put on that thread that ticked off fam when he was poking fun at the Padres. But he holds a grudge all this time, slaps him. I've never seen a guy get a, a suspension for something like that ever. Ro Rossi was asked about that the other day. He said the same thing. He says, that's why I don't play fantasy football. But I've never seen anything like that. I mean, that's the dumbest, dumbest thing I ever saw. Someone in the game told me you can't imagine the amount of money they were playing for. Well, supposedly it's a, what, a $10,000 entry fee league and then the, the first fee place from six figures. You, well, and, and you know who the commissioner is who didn't Mike do Trout. anything about it. Mike Trout didn't do anything about it. So, so, and then fam comes back, what, yesterday and, and uh, gets all over Mike Trout for, for not policing this before it got this far. It's, it's ridiculous, man. This is the world we live in. These guys are out of their minds. Gordon, enjoy the game tonight. Uh, please tell George Costanza to take it easy on the Cubs. All right, Jerry. All right. Fastballs, Jerry. <laughs> Fastballs, Jerry. That's it. Keep him hitterish. All right. Have a good night. I'll talk to you tomorrow on the pod. All right. There is our guy, Gordon Wittenmeyer, our senior Cubs insider here at NBC Sports Chicago and NBC Sports Chicago.com and the My Teams app. Time now for our stat of the day brought to you by our great friends at Ankin Law. 3126 million for the great Howard Ankin. Christopher or as he likes to be called now, Chris Morrell has a ways to go to break another on-base record. The MLB record to start a career is 47 games. Alvin Davis did that with the Seattle Mariners in 1984. Chris is at 14. Now, Alvin Davis went on AL Rookie of the Year. I guess that is a good sign for Christopher Morrell. All right, let's pivot to the Chicago Bears. Let's go on the beat. And talk to our guy, Josh Schrock. He is our Bears insider. All right, let's talk about Akeem Hicks first. Yeah. Guy's a monster. He's a great football player. He's had some injury issues lately. There was reports the Bears might be interested. Can we get him back in a one-year day? He went, yeah, I think I'm going to try and win with Tom Brady. Did it surprise you? No, not at all. I think you and I actually talked about this a couple weeks ago where we kind of pinpointed the Bucks. We're like, well, you know, if, if Dominican Sue's not coming back, that's that's a spot where a 32-year-old who wants to win a ring can go and play next to Vita Vea and just absolutely dominate. So, I mean, the contract makes a lot of sense. I mean, for the injuries, it's $6.5 million guaranteed, up to $10 million with incentive, incentives if he plays every, uh, every game. And, I mean, I, I don't think the Bears ever really thought they were going to get him back. I think with a lot of these veteran remaining free agents, these are not guys that are going to go play for a team that's going to win five or six games on a one-year deal. They're only going to come to Chicago if they get overpaid and it's a multi-year deal with guaranteed money and the Bears don't want to do that. So I wasn't surprised at all. And I think a key mix is going to, is going to play really well in Tampa Bay. So where does Andama Kong Su go then? Is there any chance he could be a bear or you know what? They pick their lane. They have no interest in moving down that road. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't see that. I think the only way and Tom can sue a bear is if Ryan Poles wakes up one morning and is just like, you know what? I'll just throw twenty million dollars out for one year because I think Sue is kind of in the same boat. I mean, I'm I'm kind of surprised the Bucks didn't bring him back. I thought he was tremendous during their playoff run. He was probably their best defensive player. Um, so, I mean, if money talks, the Bears could do it, but the Bears the Bears don't want to do that. Like they they have fifteen million dollars left in salary cap. They can roll some of that over. Um, they're not looking to compete for a Super Bowl. I know no one wants to hear that because it's competitive sport, but that's just not the goal. So, I mean, I, I have a really hard time believing Dom Kinsu is going to go anywhere where a Super Bowl is not on the on the menu. All right, you and I, I think, are pretty much – we've done several interviews together now. Yeah. Uh, we're on the same page mm -hmm. that they pick their lane. They're not going to be very good. It is what it is, but you should be able to turn it around quickly. Yep. And then I looked at Sports Illustrated's 100 bold predictions, and they've got four teams – including our Bears, competing for the number one pick. Mm -hmm. If the Bears, heaven forbid, were to go, whatever it is, 2-15, and 3-14, and 1-6, yep. and six, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and they do have the number one pick, yeah. do you think they're taking a quarterback or trading back and going, eh, it took Trey Lance three picks to move up there. We could get a haul with $150 million of cap space. Mm -hmm. It's a one-year 
tough season and you're draft well, you're turning around quickly. Yeah. I mean, I think it depends how they go two and 15 or three and 14. If, if Justin Fields is pretty good and they look at it and they're like, well, the offensive line wasn't good. We didn't give him any weapons, but the trajectory is there and they have the number one overall pick. I mean, you absolutely just hold that pick to the highest bidder, move back, you know what, five, six spots. You can still get a wide receiver or a defensive end. And then you have two more first round picks to build around in the future. That makes a ton of sense. And I think that's probably, I mean, they would never say it, but the best case scenario is they leave the season with Matt Eberflus is a really good coach. Justin Fields is a good quarterback and they were not very good and have a high pick. Right. If you said, huh, they went four and 13, yeah. they're picking fourth. They're either getting a hell of a football player right there, or mm-hmm. hopefully we traded down and we yep. picked up a one and a two, whatever the, the capital that you get back is. Mm-hmm. And you look and go, huh, we added two really good players there, a good player in the second round, hopefully hit in the third round. And then you go into free agency as well. This thing could look radically different. Yeah, and that's how that's how you do a successful rebuild. There's no such thing as a long rebuild in the NFL. It's a very short rebuild, and you have a ton of money. Um, and I think, I mean, honestly, if they get a top three pick, they can hold. Like if they get the number three pick, they could hold that number three pick for a king's ransom for the Panthers or the Seahawks or whoever is coming up to get not Bryce Young or Bryce Young or CJ Stroud, whoever's the second one off the board, right? So that's. That, that would be a dream scenario. And then you can, like I said, move back. You're still going to get Jackson Smith and Jigba or Jordan Addison or another really good wide receiver at eight or nine because that's the world we live in. These receivers are just ready. They're ready to pop right away. Um, and then you're off and running. Yeah, you're off and running. And then last thing, uh, sad to see that Marion Barber died today, the former Bears, more prominent role with the Cowboys. Uh, that was stunning news. I had not heard of any trouble or any uh ill health had you no no not at all it's just uh yeah i think i just heard a couple minutes before we came on it's very uh it's just tragic news i mean i think he was in his 40s it's i mean late 30s maybe he's super young and that's just that's sad news but no, i hadn't i hadn't heard of anything it didn't didn't sound like it was expected or, or you know, anything like that yeah i had not heard if he had been ill at all hey man i appreciate you taking time for me hey anytime captain All right, we'll talk soon. That's Josh Rock. He's our Bears insider. It's time now for our tip of the cap. Brought to you by, or as we like to say, powered by our great friends at PointsBet. Okay, here are the MVP odds for the NBA final that tips off tomorrow. Steph Curry is the favorite. Even money. Bet 100, you'll you'll get back 200. You'll win your 100 back and 100 profit. Uh, Jason Tatum at plus 160. You've got Clay Thompson at 13 to 1. You also have uh, a long shot playing there. Jalen Brown, of course, 13 to 1, but Jordan Poole, 40 to 1. And that dude can score. And then the winner, if you believe it's going seven games, you're going to get six to one on your money with Boston. You're going to get plus 325 if you bet on Golden State. So it should be a fun final. The Stanley Cup gets going tonight. All right, time to cap it off. I know that everybody is disappointed with the White Sox. I get it. Last night, Danny Mendick with a horrific base running blunder cost the White Sox the tying run. Reese McGuire standing on third, Danny Mendick's on first, deep fly ball. They're not even going to try a throw home. Reese McGuire is jogging home and Danny Mendick decides he's going to try and get the second. He's gunned out before McGuire touches home. Score stays 6-5. Sox get shut out in the 7th, the 8th, and the ninth, and they lose the ballgame 6-5. And everybody is just furious. Fans and media are crushing Danny Mendick. And he made a horrible, horrible decision. He also had two hits last night. That said, the White Sox enter play tonight. They are three games behind Minnesota in the loss column. That's the one column that really counts because I believe they have four games in hand. With rainouts, the Twins have played a couple doubleheaders. They've played four more games. Folks, I know you don't want to hear this. You fan how you want to fan. I'm just telling you my advice to you is to relax because on July 31st, 2021, that's last July, 
The Atlanta Braves were 52 and 54. You could have bet them at 65 to 1 to win the World Series. They added Jock Peterson at the deadline from the Cubs. They added Jorge Soler. Their pitching got healthy and they got on a roll and they're wearing rings today. So there is a lot of talent on this baseball team. They've got to stay afloat while Tim Anderson is on the injured list. Their offense has got to continue to play better. It was better last night. It's got to continue to be better. You got Luis Robert back. You have Lance Lynn coming. You got to have solid starting pitching. Lucas Giolito has got to be better, as does Dylan Cease. The White Sox have a very, very good team. Let's see when they get to late June where they are when they get all their weapons back. Thank you for watching our show on YouTube TV tonight. I'm back in the studio. I have a sport coat on and ready to go. You have a great night. White Sox baseball is on the main channel. They're tied right now early in the ballgame with the Blue Jays. 1-1. Have a wonderful evening. I'll see you tomorrow. Take that.